back in Amsterdam uh, with my surname of Hog and my relative height. I always get confused for someone who's actually Dutch, uh, and everybody sp starts speaking to me in, in Dutch, and I have no idea what they're saying. Uh, I do my best to get my umbrella out ahead of time. So, uh, here to talk to you a little bit about Sonder, but I don't want to be too focused on Sonder. It's not a it's not a pitch for us or anything like that. Uh, I'm also not a tech person. I am our uh, general manager for UK and Ireland, looking after our whole business there. So, perhaps I bring a little bit of a different perspective. I wanted to tell you a bit about who we are, but then I wanted to quickly get into something a little bit that I thought you might find interesting, uh, which are lessons that I've learned uh, coming a lot from the airline industry and how the airlines, in some ways, ahead of, uh, ahead of hospitality and some of the, the paths that they've blazed uh, that, that we might be following now, starting to get involved with and getting involved with more in the future as well. But first, I did want to talk about Sonder and who we are. Uh, we are a San Francisco-based, uh, tech-enabled hospitality company. Uh, and our goal is to become the world's largest, most importantly, most loved hospitality brand. We don't want to be a brand that's just the biggest. We want to also be loved. We want you to literally come and stay in our places and cry tears of joy that you've been in the most incredible place that you've ever experienced. Uh, and I can go on and on about how our MPS shows that we're getting there and how that's really important. Uh, but really, this is, this is the key differentiator for us. Uh, we started about five years ago in Montreal, Canada, uh, but made the decision to make a wholesale move of our headquarters from Montreal to San Francisco. And that was designed for two factors. One was to be closer to our venture capital funds, uh, who were very important to us and to the growth that we were looking to achieve. And the second was to start to tap into tech talent. Uh, I said we're tech enabled, what does that mean? Everybody tosses it around, everybody wants to be that to increase their valuations and things. But we are indeed tech enabled. We have 125 engineers based out in San Francisco uh, with a second center actually opening in Canada and another in Europe to follow. Those engineers are doing things in-house, similar to what you heard from OIO. They're, they're building out our own property management system. Uh, we have direct API integrations with all of our largest channels, uh, and we're doing as much in-house as we possibly can, including things like access systems and, and everything that sits on the back end. So we are indeed tech-enabled in a very big way. Uh, importantly as well, we are recruiting uh, our engineers not from ex-Hilton or ex-Hyatt, they're, they're, they're ex-Uber, they're ex-Amazon, and they actually bring that really interesting blend of tech and, uh, and actually the logistics that sit behind this. And this gives us a, a really key operating advantage when we look at and we look at our staffing models and how we're able to deliver value for our customers. And that's because we're able to staff on a city basis, not on an asset basis. If you think about when you open a hotel, a traditional hotel, a big, a big piece of real estate, you tend to think, okay, I'm going to get a general manager in there, I'm going to get a revenue manager in there, I'm going to get X number of housekeepers, X number of people in the front desk, all of that. We do away with that. We staff on the city level. We think of one general manager per city. We think of one senior operations manager per city. We think of a large team of people that are roaming throughout the city all the time. And the key that sits behind all of that is logistics. Right? And this is where this next bit comes in. Right? We want to become something that sits between hotels and individual, and individual hosts. We want to deliver you something that looks and feels like an Airbnb type experience, but with the consistency and quality of a hotel. And the way we do that is we, we start to get a tech-enabled brand that owns more of the supply chain, more of the value chain of what we're actually doing. And so we go into a market and we will lease a whole building uh, and we will then go in and fit it out ourselves with our own furnishing, every uh, space being looked at by an interior designer who's going to produce something interesting and feels that it's actually something that looks like a home, something that you would find on Airbnb. And no surprise, Airbnb is one of our largest channels. Um, so we saw this, this, this kind of evolution, and a lot of people talk about disruption and everything that comes with that. But you know, in reality, it's really an evolution. Uh, if you look at it from independent hotels to box chains to peer-to-peer -peer and now tech-enabled brands, and we think this, this kind of progression from Walmart to eBay to Amazon is something very similar that the hospitality industry will, will be looking at as well. Uh, but what's interesting with all three of those that sit below uh, this chart here is that at the heart of all of them is logistics and technology. Right. People think of Walmart as like this you know, backwards company from the South in America, uh, but actually they were at the forefront of logistics and technological improvements that were able to move their packages all around the world to deliver low cost to their customers in, in mainly rural America. So they were really pioneers here. eBay took it to a different level, and then obviously Amazon's taken it to a completely different level. 
But that logistic question and how we apply technology to that is incru incredibly crucial for how we get hospitality to this next level as well. And that's what we feel we're doing at Sonder. I said, we want you to cry tears of joy because they're going to be spaces that look like this. These are interior designers uh, that we have working for us uh, across the world who are designing beautiful, incredible spaces that we're able to deliver. This is a two-bedroom in the heart of Covent Garden in, in, in London that we're able to deliver for 181 pounds uh, per room per night. And this is in New York, in the financial district, literally right next door to Wall Street on 20 Broad. Uh, and we're able to deliver this for $225 a night. So we're delivering incredible spaces. Uh, here's some of the numbers. Uh, you know, we, we, we are uh, growing incredibly fast. We've been on this exponential growth. We now have uh, roughly 10,000 units signed across uh, North America and increasingly in Europe. Uh, we've raised, uh, including venture debt, over half a billion dollars at a unicorn valuation. And you know, you see there, uh, kind of thing I'm most most impressed with is is our MPS, our able our ability to deliver incredible service for our guests. Uh, sitting globally at 71, proud to say in UK and Ireland we're up in the 80s. That's higher. That's higher than the Four Seasons, right? And we're going to get into what we do, uh, which is effectively take a lot of it, uh, a lot of the experience, and, and self-automate it. And being able to do that but still deliver such an incredible experience that you're comparing it to the Four Seasons is something very, very special. And we have units that go from 75 pounds a night up to 2,000 pounds a night in, in London. So we're not just dealing with some entry level, uh, you know, people expect nothing. Actually, people expect a lot when they pay 2,000 pounds a night for a property. And we're able to deliver them something which is exactly what they want and nothing what, that they don't want. And that brings us on to what I actually kind of wanted to talk about. Uh, which is given some of my background put up here. Uh, I'm actually, I was a lawyer for my sins. Uh, then, then I became a consultant at Bain. Uh, I was working for some of the oldest, I mean Freshfields was literally is a 300 year old law firm uh, and Millbank wasn't far behind, Bain as well. And then I had this crazy idea that I'd buy this big house up in Scotland which is 400 years old and turn it into a hotel. Uh, so I did that a, a few years back uh, and it's, it's you know, a country house hotel, very F&B heavy, uh, you know, I literally price my rooms based on seasons still, which you guys will probably laugh at. Uh, but you know, that that kind of old stodgy experience, uh, you know, led me to Saunders. And the reason it led me to Saunders was because a lot of the work that I did throughout that career, uh, throughout those careers, was was actually working with travel and tourism companies, and in particular uh, with a lot of companies in the airline industry. And that's why I thought it might be a little bit interesting to start to bring in some of that. And apologies, I was doing my slides at about midnight last night, so they're really not very nice. Uh, but uh, they're basic. I wanted to cover some topics that I thought airlines had really gotten out in front of and done a great job at uh, starting to plow the, plow the way uh, on, on some of these really key themes that we can talk about as well in terms of hospitality. So first one really for us is unbundling. This is how basic the slides are getting, guys. So uh, airlines have done, over the last 20 years, an amazing job of picking apart what they actually put into a price. And they've taken out you know, any kind of newspapers, entertainment, soft drinks, hard drinks, food, uh, and probably most importantly, luggage, checked luggage in particular but also carry on. And what we've seen as a result of this is that ancillary revenue, which is mainly this, plus others that I'll come on to, has grown increasingly through the years. Really out of date data, but this trend has, has significantly continued. And if we think of that ancillary data of all this stuff that used to be part of a fare getting unbundled, there's other ancillary revenue, things like uh, cross-selling with uh, rental car providers and uh, with uh, you know, your Uber or Lyft. You can, on, on the Delta app in the US, you can get your Lyft through the app. Uh, so you know, talking to, to people earlier about what that means for hospitality, why are we not doing more cross-selling? How are we not integrating this more? People want things in one place. Airlines are out in front already starting to own those integrations and bringing everything into their ecosystem. But what we're trying to think about at Sonder is what do people actually want in their stay at the very core? And what can we start to offer as an option? And so thought of it, think of it like this, right? Cleaning is the, the obvious example. Uh, you, you, people want a fresh, clean room when they arrive. Done. OK. Everybody un accepts that. How often should you clean their room? Once every three days, four days, five days? What does a clean really mean? Does it mean does it mean taking off the sheets, putting new sheets on? Does it mean just giving them additional towels? Does it mean refreshing the toiletries? What if they're pumps? All of that, right? So what we're trying to do in Sonder is, is take cleaning, for example, 
and unbundle it. We're not saying that you're going to get daily clean every day and fresh sheets every three or four days. What we're saying is that you get a fresh room when you arrive. If you want additional towels, we'll deliver those to you at two bucks. If you want fresh seats, we'll deliver those to you whenever you want. We'll put them on the bed, of course, and we will do that for 10 bucks. We're going to give you, as the consumer, the option to choose when you want something and whether you're willing to pay for it, which is going to drive down our, our pricing on the initial fare that you see as the consumer, but then also provide additional ancillary revenue for us as we get better at pricing these things, as we get better of actually charging a margin on them for us as well. So key, key thing to watch on this is how do we take back uh, things to the core product and then start to upsell on everything else that we're, we're trying to offer as services. And so what that allows us to do really when you unbundle Airlines have learned that it actually then allows you to, to customer segment and, and kind of rebundle. So when you unbundle things, you then start to learn who actually wants something and what are those customers. So the reason I picked this slide was that you get uh, you, you start to talk about designed for travelers who desire an elevated experience, right? You start to then segment your customer base because you understand exactly what they want. That a business traveler doesn't ever really want fresh sheets, but they do want fresh towels. That, that a business traveler uh, only cares about self-checking and getting into their unit as quickly as possible, something we provide all of our, all of our uh, guests because when you check into a Sonder, you get a text, uh, an email, and WhatsApp, and something sent through the app that gives you the code to get into your building and then the code to get into your unit. We provide that to everybody, but we also understand that a lot of our leisure guests want someone there to, to show them around, teach them how to use things, and so we provide that as well as, as an option. And so we start to be able to segment our actual customers as well, similar to what the airline industry has been doing uh, recently. Moving on from, from, from the unbundling into disintermediation. What I mean by disintermediation is the ability for a, a, a market to take out the middlemen. And what we mean here for hospitality operators and as well for airlines are OTAs. Right? And so I just post this up here as a big question. Right? Why do airlines get to pay 3 to 4% in commission to Expedia and Booking and hotels be paying 15 to 18% on average? Right? What, what are they doing? And a lot of it has to do with, with market concentration. You know, uh, American Airlines makes up estimated between 1% and 2% of Expedia's revenue. That's a pretty big uh, thing to lose. Uh, Hilton isn't you know, anywhere near that. Uh, so so there, is, there, is, there are structural elements of, of, of this that, that sit behind there. But, but also it's about their willingness to walk away from the table. So I worked a bit at EasyJet. Uh, and uh, speaking again before, before this, at EasyJet you tend to actually book direct. Their, their goal is to get 100% direct bookings. They've only recently pivoted a bit away from that to start to distribute a bit via MetaSearches and others. Uh, but, but historically, you book an EasyJet flight just via the app, and it's pretty easy, the app's good enough, and you just go through and you do it. Um, you know, hotels, are, we're still a little bit uh, behind on that, and I'm not going to sit here and preach that I, I, I know what exactly the answer is to how we fix this, but just something to think about as you develop new technology and we start to try to bring more direct bookings and, and start to disintermediate, how do we achieve bridging this gap? Because airlines have, have certainly done it. Uh, then we talk about dynamic pricing. Uh, amazingly, this wasn't discussed in the OYO presentation because it's pretty much all they talk about. Uh, and dynamic pricing is, is, is something that airlines have done for a very, very long time. Uh, and you'll know it because you've gone and searched for an airfare, and it's not the same pr price today as it was yesterday, and you're really pissed off. And that change has happened pretty much overnight. Um, and so I asked you, how many times are you changing your prices? And a lot of you guys are coming from tech. And so you're going to tell me that actually the systems and solutions that you've developed are doing exactly this. They're automated. There's, they're they're algorithm-based and, and all of that. And I'm glad we are finally, finally getting there as an industry. Uh, but I just want to say that you know, the frequency with which these are changing is incredibly important. And uh, as we get better data that, that allows us to size supply and demand and, and respond to that instantaneously, that'll be really the key to driving hospitality uh, dynamic pricing as well. So uh, you know, OYO sits at a great advantage because they have such scale uh, that, they can, that they can get a lot of, um, a lot of pricing data internally. Uh, we will uh, be getting, we, we already have that to a large extent in Sonder. Uh, we can obviously tap into data, external data sources like an AirDNA or like uh, uh, you know, other sources that are out there for, for hotels that, that give you something on this. But until we actually start to uh, share data a bit more openly and get uh, a bit better idea of what those curves look like, uh, we're still going to be behind airlines. Also wanted to talk quickly on self-service, and so this, this gets to similar things in terms of unbundling because we're able to charge for it, 
But, but this is an example from an American Airlines flight. If your flight's canceled or, or whatnot, it's now pushing you uh, into booking the next available flight or what might be the most convenient thing. It's actually going beyond that in terms of automation. It's actually saying, we've already booked you a seat on that flight. Can you please confirm that's where you want to be? And, and getting that one step ahead of your customer uh, is really important. So how, what might this look like in accommodation and technology? It might look like uh, that you've inputted your flight details, we've tracked your flight details, we realize through our systems that your flight is delayed, so you're not gonna make check-in until 2 a.m. And so we've, we've actually pushed that to you and say, hey, nobody's gonna be on the front desk, there is no front desk in our, a lot of our properties, here's your code, it'll work for you to get in, and actually we've already adjusted your Uber because you booked that through us as well. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what we'd like to get into as the future of integrating all of this together and automating it and anticipating when especially something goes wrong because those are the most important touch points. Uh, last thing I wanted to touch on uh, in my last minute here is loyalty. Um, and it's really a buzzword in, in, in hospitality right now and you kind of think through uh, you know, what all of this means to get to the next tier of status. Um, and I don't have, again, great all-encompassing solutions for this, and Saunders certainly doesn't. We haven't touched loyalty at all as a business. It's something we're gonna have to look into. Uh, but one thing I'd, I'd leave you with is, is that people who have looked at airline loyalty over time have focused in on what the individual customer, especially business travelers, want to get out of their loyalty programs and what really matters. So we were talking earlier about um, you know, if we're in the uh, vacation rentals type business or Airbnb type business, what does an upgrade really look like? If I have a business traveler staying with me, do I upgrade them from a one bedroom to a two bedroom? They don't care, they don't need the second bedroom, it doesn't add anything to them. If you're in a hotel and you, add, you upgrade someone from a superior to a, uh, an executive suite, do they really care? Is it really what they want? Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done on loyalty in hospitality to figure out what it is that these key customers actually want to get when they show their loyalty to you and how you can actually reward them and, and, and upgrade them, make their experience a better experience. Maybe it's comping their Uber. Maybe it's making sure that they've got a bottle of their favorite bubbly in the room. It's, it's much more individualized, it's much more uh, practical than necessarily just shoving them up to the next room. Uh, and so again, we can use technology to help collect that data and process that data and anticipate those things. So uh, that is all from me. Thank you all very much. Look forward to the panel.